Tonight, we're going to visit several ghost towns, a little bit in Douglas County, not much mining in Douglas County, and even less in Carson City County, Old Ormsby County. We'll get right into Lyon County. We're going to talk about the uh, Carson Colorado Railroad. We're going to hop on the train and go down toward Hawthorne and be there for the founding of the town, Candelaria, and running that country. But it's always a pleasure to come here and hope come back again we can talk about some other things because I never show the same place show twice in any one locality and, I, and like many other people I mix up the slides and get new new shows going on and got some something new planned for next summer about ghost town relics uh, things that people find out in the ghost towns and show ghost town pictures along with uh, paper materials and relics that people find out in ghost towns so last, last time, as, a, as I was saying, uh, we talked about the oldest settlements. And that would be 1850, 1851, right into the late 50s. And so without further ado, we'll begin right where we left off <coughs> nine, ten months ago in the town of Genoa. <laughs> no. Oh, they finally found a seat. Yes. <laughs> oh. Lori, can you guys close that door? Please? Wait, we got somebody coming. So I got here a half hour earlier, we would have had a bigger picture because I've got the screen further back to get my projector. But this is uh, Hanson's Bar Saloon in old Genoa in the 1860s, late 60s, when uh, Genoa was no longer the largest town in, in western Nevada because Carson City and Virginia City took over those honors. Typical bar saloon with uh, people standing around. Uh, uh, a long bar on the right with uh, pictures of um, animals, women, things like that in the, at the bar, and of course the specimens of uh, maybe an elk or something like that. But that, that road from Genoa coming in here was going through Sacramento and Placerville. Here's a, a night scene going over the Sierra Nevada by J. Ross Brown, who sketched this in the 60s, and he sketched many, many things in western Nevada Back then, it's all in a book called A Peep at Washoe. And the people from uh, Sacramento, Strawberry Lodge, so forth, stopped by Friday's Station here in 1861, en route to Virginia City and the, go and the silver fields that were just discovered up there. Because for a long time, the Virginia City area was uh, a bunch of uh, gold miners were there, Placer gold miners, who were mining rock gravel gold. But in this picture, we see uh, many interesting things. On the far right uh, is, is one wagon, and wagons are in front of the station at Friday's, which would be just about where the Harris uh, High Rise Hotel is at South Lake Tahoe. And inside, there was uh, comfort for, for man, and then corrals in the back for, for the beasts. And the famous one over the the route of the uh, of what's now U.S. 50, the uh, route to uh, Cal from California, from Sacramento, going towards South Tahoe and up in the western Nevada, the young Nevada Territory, was Hank Monk. And here's a picture of him. He's very famous for his um, 
driving uh, Horace Greeley, the noted New York Tribune editor from, uh, from near Sacramento to get him over to Carson City, Virginia City. He said, hold on, Horace, I'll get you there. I'll get you there on time. And sure enough, uh, uh, Horace, uh, the skilled driver, uh, Hank Mont, the skilled driver, got Horace Greeley in Western Nevada. And he wrote uh, his adventures in Western Nevada into a book called The Life of Horace Greeley. It's very good reading. Up at, um, along the west shore of uh, Douglas County, uh, along the, along the uh, east shore of Lake Tahoe, <coughs> west side of Douglas County, was Glenbrook. And uh, I have several old pictures, but I snuck in three of them this afternoon, knowing I'd have a guest who would come here from uh, Glenbrook, who used to live there. This is one of the large sawmills that were there. And the shed over there on the left, uh, my pointer's in the other room. I, I should go get it in a few minutes. I was a shed of the railroad, the Glenbrook Railroad, which, which ran up from here uh, up to the summit of, of uh, Spooner Summit, where the railroad ended. And that's where the plumes began to take cut wood from Glenbrook to, to, the, uh, to the south end of Carson City. Uh, about two shows ago, about two years ago, I, I went into all that detail in a slideshow and be glad to give it again someday. But at Glenbrook, there was uh, hotels like the Durego House and the, here's another one, Lake Shore House. There, um, right on the shores of Glenbrook, this one had a bowling alley in it. And in the early 1860s, when Virginia City grew to be so large, 15 to 18,000 people, uh, the townspeople of Virginia City would come to Glenbrook, sort of, of a blow-off place for recreation, rather than stay up there hearing all the mine blasts and all the talk of mining up there in Virginia City in the early 1860s. But in Virginia City itself, it developed quite rapidly because of the square-set timbering method, uh, where, where um, uh, with this method, the, the stopes and, and underground mining was developed very nicely because uh, all the timber was shored up by all that square set timbering. Virginia City grew fast and in 1861 a large uh, mill was built at the foot of Six Mile Canyon. Now that would be way down at the lower end of Virginia City and there's hardly even a foundation of this huge three-story building left nowadays. And the big suburb of Virginia City was Gold Hill. Here's the Crown Point uh, hoisting works, dead set in the middle of this picture. About This picture was taken about 1861, no, no, 1862. And about nine years later, the Virginian Truckee Railroad would be built in back of this building. On the far lower right is Vesey's Hotel. And this is the earliest picture of a hotel built in Nevada, and now it's part of the Gold Hill Hotel, which is now, everyone of you in this audience knows about the Gold Hill Hotel. Virginia City exploited uh, heavy weather, snows, winds, and also fires, but the volunteer fire department was very, very, very uh, professional in getting out fires in Virginia City. Of course, in 1869, the Virginia Truckee Railroad was built from Carson City to Virginia City, and within two years it was built from Carson into Reno on the main line Central Pacific. Here's a siding where one train off to the side is allowing another train to go ahead at a point south of Virginia City. Below Virginia City was Gold Hill, as I mentioned earlier, Silver City, and the Devil's Gate, and this was a toll station. And on the left is the toll house and a heavily uh, laden stagecoach is there on the left, going off the picture to the left. Now, with so many people on board that stagecoach, they only went a few miles. In fact, they only went about three miles up to Virginia City. But this is the Devil Gates toll house. And that rocky crag in the background is still, of course, there today. Beyond it is Silver City which is shown here. And this is looking north, early from Silver City, about 1862, 1863. There's a hoist house in the front, and the main street is very well depicted through the center of this photograph. 
and a flag was flying at the end of town. And then Silver City grew rapidly, and within six years, it was a much larger place. Then along the Virginian Truckee Railroad, the big thing was hauling ore, silver laden ore from Virginia City down to the Carson River where there was a series of seven reduction works, uh, uh, mills. This, this one was not along the line of the Virginian Truckee, but rather this one is about a quarter mile east. So if you're in the old mountain house and you go south, toward the river on the old VNT grade. The new grade is further west. And you go uh, just before you get to the Santiago cut, and then the railroad goes west. If you're about three miles south of Mountain House, you look to the left, there used to be a chute there to take the, to take the ore down to a baby gauge railroad, which comes in from the picture on the left, and it turns right here at the Eureka Mill, uh, one of Comstock's large of 40 stamp mill mills along the Carson River. But I said in my opening remark we talked about the Carson Colorado Railroad. It ran from Mount House between Carson and Dayton, through Dayton, past Wabuska, that would be in the north end of Mason Valley, along the east side of Walker Lake into Hawthorne, and down through Candelaria, which is a very famous ghost town southeast of Hawthorne. And all of a sudden, the railroad ducks into California, goes down past Bishop, and down Logan Pine into Keeler. And it really was never a much of a money maker. It did haul a lot of ore out and brought supplies into all these mining camps I just mentioned. And someone quipped and said, the Carson Colorado Railroad, it was built either 200 years too soon or 200 miles too long. <laughs> uh, the first town east of uh, Dayton was uh, silk of the town of Sutro, at the mouth of the Sutro Tunnel. And of course, when a photographer would come, everyone would stop and want the picture taken, between those ladies in parasol or, or rain, uh, uh, probably just for, for, to keep out the sun. But uh, nowadays, you really can't go to the Mouth Central Tunnel because it's all private. But if you slip the guy a $20 bill, he'll let you go in there and take a look at the Mouth of Central Tunnel and the other buildings around the old town of Sutro. Dayton was the first town east of um, Mound House. And this courthouse was built, as many were through Nevada, where the county seats were, the, early, the nine early county seats of Nevada in 1864. Well, uh, this is a picture in, around 1905, about four years before the top half of the courthouse burned. And now the bottom half is still there. It's the senior cent center in Dayton nowadays on the south side of Pike Street. But this gave rise to Darrington and Mason Valley becoming more populous that uh, the county seat was moved to Darrington in, in 1911. So Dayton was the first county seat of Lyon County, then lost the honor to Garrington in 1911. East of Dayton, here's a um, picture of a uh, train wreck, or a train actually slid, uh, slid off the tracks. But with the, with the use of uh, those timbers and the jacks, was able to put the train back on the track of the Carson Colorado Railroad, hauling plenty of fuel, of course, and then there's cars in the back that would haul produce and some cattle to points east of Dayton. Now the Carson Colorado Railroad, who was built in 1881, was narrow gauge, which meant that at Dayton, or excuse me, at Mount House, any, anything shipped on the Carson Colorado Railroad to all those towns like Hawthorne and Candelaria, everything had to be taken off of the Virginia Truckee Railroad at Dayton, at, uh, at at uh, Mound House and put on the narrow gauge. Well, the Southern Pacific Railroad bought this, the Carson Colorado Railroad in the spring of 1900. And that was only a three or four months before the big discovery of Tonopah. And of course, the Southern Pacific made a lot of money because all kinds of things had to be shipped into Tonopah. But they, the Southern Pacific did not want to tolerate this narrow gauge business. 
So they enlarged the track, like across the Carson River here, about two or three miles east of downtown Dayton. That on the left there is a pile driver, which uh, was helping to reinforce the, the bridge east of Dayton with additional timber so you can broaden the track. And on the right over there is this Carson, Colorado work train coming into the picture. Very scarce early photograph of Dayton. And of course, down at Dayton, uh, there'd be fires there as well. This one, the, uh, uh, the Stevenson Mill uh, burned down and was never, never rebuilt. Uh, from a point near um, Deer Run Road in Carson City, eastward along the Carl River, or down, uh, along the Carson River, even past Dayton, there was as many as nine mills at one time. Uh, to to reduce the ores from the Comstock load. Up at Como, here's a inside of a uh, an assay office. The guy's hung up his coat, probably ducked out of the picture for a while. But he's got his little uh, all, all the cupola and the cupolas there on the table, and the simple uh, the simple um, furnace there retort to to just to see. Um, just a test, that's what assays were. A test to see how the ores were in the Como mining district. Uh, to see whether to explore further along a certain vein or, or just abandoned. Further east of, um, of Dayton was... Is there anything left at Como? Uh, up at Como, I haven't been there about seven or eight years, but the road's extremely rough. And uh, there's some foundations, but when I first saw it around 1860, 1960. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. A little bit tired from the long drive. Today. Uh, 1960, there was a stamp mill there, and there were several buildings uh, le uh, left over from a later boom, the 1912-1916. Further east of, of, but you're welcome to interrupt with a question. Uh, is Dayton was was the was the was the spring station uh, over at uh, halfway between Dayton and so and um, and uh, Silver Springs, the modern town. And Mark Twain, in his book *Roughing It*, uh, describes his adventures in Nevada in 1861, Carson City, Virginia City, and and he was at Desert Spring Station here, and they wandered around in the snow and lost their way, and Mark Twain. Um, I uh, was with his friend Higby and Ollendorf, the three of them here trying to huddle on the fire. They tried to start the fire by firing their guns into some wood. <laughs> that didn't work, but the snow was falling all night, and uh, finally got the fire going, and Mark Twain said, I'm going to give up my pipe, you know, thinking you'd be dying. And Higby is his, uh, his um, liquor, and Ollendorf his card playing. But the next morning, all of a sudden, there was Desert Well Station right out there, and guess what? <laughs> Mark Twain resumed his uh, smoking, and Higby is uh, drinking in an old Orpheus card plane, and you see this picture from the first edition of Mark Twain's book. Unfortunately, later editions of Roughing It, there's been about 20 of them, don't include all these nice comic cartoons like this. And further east, we're still we're going along the Carson Colorado Railroad, which is on the south side of the Carson River, but on the north side was Fort Churchill. A man named Brown came out and and built and uh, took a picture, made this lithograph of the Fort Churchill parade grounds, along with the officers' quarters and all those other buildings. And the listed men lived in tents in the lower left portion of the building of this picture. But as you know, there's only a few adobes left there at Fort Churchill, but still a nice place to camp. And there's a nice visitor center there at Fort Churchill. A lot of the materials went over to Bucklands and to build this Buckland Station, which is on the east side of US 95, about a mile east of um, Fort Churchill and about 10 miles south of Silver Springs. I remember going in there about 25 years when this building was wide open, building some of the windows were broken. There were some artifacts in there, old correspondence and postcard cancellations, things like that. And now, of course, it's been restored and it's private and uh, looks very, it's restored to its original dignity. 
And further south is Wabuska Station. Uh, there's a watering hole there today, you know, yeah. along the uh, Carson and Colorado Railroad. Now it, it took on the Southern Pacific name after the Southern Pacific bought it in 1900. And from here, the Copper Belt Railroad ran past Garrington, all the way down the Walker River and back up toward Ludwig. And we'll see Ludwig here in a minute. In fact, here it is right now. And this was Ludwig in his heyday around 1905, 1906. There's huge and vast foundations that are left there today at Ludwig. They're acres and acres. And uh, these Indians are gambling near Mason, which is just right near Yarrington. Uh, uh, it's considered a ghost town because Mason used to have almost a thousand people, and now it's sort of a spillover area from Yarrington. Here's Yarrington itself, where the courthouse is. The people in Dayton uh, accused the people in Yarrington in 1909 of setting fire to their own courthouse in Dayton so they get the county seat. Uh, probably just an exaggerated story. But as soon as the county seat came to Yarrington, a nice big two-story courthouse was built on the left, serving Lyon County. Here's Mason, and the large mercantile story is on the right, and on the left you see uh, all kinds of hay and grain sacked up, uh, ready to take away to all the ranches up and down the Walker River. And going further south, uh, off the railroad, was the mining camp of Pine Grove. And you can see uh, the, this is a typical long line team, 10 or 12 animals. Uh, these are all horses. Sometimes they mules in the front and horses in the back near, in the back near the tongue of the wagon. All driven by the, the uh, teamster who is on the, on the uh, right wheel horse. You can just barely see him. I'm going to get my, I'd love to have my, point, uh, it's right over on the far. Up above is these two helpers called Swampers. They're hauling a bunch of wood into Pine Grove Mining Camp, which is about 30 miles south of, of Yarrington. And here's where it looked way back in the 1880s. And on the right is a five stamp mill. There's foundations that left today. But Pine Grove had about 250 people. And there's a couple of grades, and, and there's still four or five buildings up there uh, left to see. Finally, along the east side of uh, Walker Lake, uh, that's where the Carson Carl Railroad was built. When they got as far as Hawthorne, ads like this, 1881, advertised uh, in the uh, Candelaria newspaper, in the Carson and Reno newspapers, of the new town of Hawthorne being auctioned off in April of 1881. And this is a very rare shot of the auction scene, the very day of the uh, auction. Stan, where is your pointer? Uh, it, it's, in, it's in that big box which I brought the slides in. Thank you. Uh, another work train is coming in from the right, just beyond those tents. And you can barely see Walker Lake, uh, just beyond those tents. Of course, Walker Lake back in then was almost 75% bigger than it is today. But the auction's going on uh, in that platform over there, at the left middle of the picture. And the first few... Uh -oh. <laughs> that's the one you make. That's, it. that's That's it. Thank you. Right in here, the auction scene. And there's there was a couple of people who wrote, wrote diaries. We got it. Uh, uh, in their diary, wrote about um, the early Mineral County, it was called Esmeralda back in those days, uh, describing the auction scene at Hawthorne. And Hawthorne grew quickly. Within a few months, uh, there were all kinds of uh, horse-drawn wagons heading out to mining camps, uh, such as Marietta, Candelaria, and so forth, uh, along the main street of Hawthorne. The main street was along the tracks. Uh, the railroad tracks of the Carson Colorado Railroad. And this is what happens if you keep a slide in too long. <laughs> Your machine. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to take this picture again, but it's so, so good. It shows a jet black uh, Carson Colorado train 
Here's a man with a bicycle right here, a boy, uh, trying to get in the picture. But it's a very rare shot, and I, I don't know if I can find that picture again. Uh, Ludwig's, or uh, Gerby's Meat Market. And, uh, Hawthorne declined in the 1890s, like most of Nevada. Came back in 1905 when there were big new mining booms going on at uh, Aurora being uh, revived, up there at Rawhide, and the meat market was a popular place in Hawthorne. And Hawthorne grew to be a pretty stable community. In 1907, it lost the county seat to Goldfield, because Goldfield was 20, 25 times bigger by then. But a new county was created in 1911, and Hawthorne, the old courthouse, which is still there in Hawthorne, was um, dusted off. Uh, as one person said, they took off the cobwebs off the ceiling and, and just repainted everything. And Hawthorne was still a town of about 2,000. North of Hawthorne was the town of Walker Lake. And US 95, the modern road goes right across there today. And the only way to get there would be by boat. And so you went from Hawthorne to the east side, at the Gillis siding over on the side, and then boats would go across. And so there's the Walker Lake Navigation Company served this mining camp of, uh, of uh, Dutch Creek. And I, I interviewed one person in the 1960s describing what was going on. He said, there was no sheriff, no law enforcement here. And people would go out just for kicks, just shoot their guns down the street. He's probably exaggerating a little bit. But anyway, it's a good story. But Walker Lake, the town of uh, uh, Dutch Creek, only lasted a couple of years because the mines in back of the camera uh, petered out rather quickly, the gold mines. And Lucky Boy uh, was way high above Hawthorne. Hawthorne is right there. Walker Lake is over, way back in there. And Lucky Boy is on the grade. You go south of Hawthorne on the road to um, Lee Vining, about three miles, then you catch the Lucky Boy Road. And the mining camp was sprawled all over, all over the hillside. As, early, as one early newspaper man said, mining camps just are like tin cans. You just you throw them on the side of a hillside, and that's the way my, uh, Lucky Boy lived. One of the big investors was Tasker Audi, later to become governor. And, but he lost a lot of money at Lucky Boy, so Lucky Boy mining camp was not so lucky for Tasker Audi. Evening, uh, excuse me, uh, the winter scene of the Carson Colorado Railroad going up into a toward Candelaria, about 40 miles southeast of Hawthorne. And you see the snow plow right here. Uh, you get into Candelaria itself. And this is unbelievable. If you have ever visited Candelaria, not so much lately because of all the modern mining, but back uh, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, you see all this green, this burden, uh, plant life, because it's just a dry, dusty place. But here's a CNC train uh, on a spur that went into Candelaria, hauling out ore and hauling in supplies. Another scene, the, the mill, which there's still foundations left to right over off the picture to the left, and this is looking east, the cemetery would be way over in there, and all the modern open pit is way over to the right, even encroaching upon the town site. But Candelaria had um, a population about 700 at one time, Chinatown in Candelaria, <coughs> usually off by itself. The Chinamen preferred that. Uh, here's a couple of um, uh, this 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 uh, low wagon right here is hauling wood out to a nearby mining camp, such as maybe Columbus and Belleville. Belleville was on on the railroad and. Um, from, you come down from Looning, Mina, and then take that road to the left, which uh, I think is Highway 360, and the Belleville town site is marked by a state marker. There was quite a town there in, in, in its day, in the 1880s, 1890s, because of two large silver mills there. What's nice about this picture is instead of horses and mules, there's a bunch of um, uh, oxen actually transporting 
uh, or how uh, uh, taking the wagon. You, if, if oxen were used, that's um, that's some serious weight because oxen were very strong. Uh, oxen would haul mine, milling machinery, mine machinery, things like that. Where in an ordinary wagon, horses, mules weren't strong enough. Oxen were easily cared for at night. You didn't even have to tie them up like you would do, did mules, which would run away. And very docile, and they, they pretty well took care of themselves. But I mentioned that Belleville was those large mule, mills, and here is one of them right here. The other one's off the picture over there. But here is the Belleville town site, the modern Highway 360 between Mina and going toward California, way over in there. And here's the town site. And as you can see, the town is nearly a mile long, but not very wide. See, there's no side streets, very, very, very little. And the reason for this, many early mining camps and milling centers would uh, say, well, I went into Belleville, and uh, the town's a mile long, and there's five saloons and four general stores and a bank and so forth, and a newspaper office. Well, a mile long, that's pretty impressive, but, but how wide was it? Hardly any. <laughs> Hardly at all. Here's the last trestle before ore was discharged, or before um, fuel was discharged into the mill of Belleville. And of course, that large abutment right here is still there today. No reason why it will be there till the second coming of Christ. <laughs> here at Columbus, this this teamster, this uh, this prospector, excuse me, is, has all kinds of um, barrels, mostly with water in them, and uh, he's heading out with his two mules out to look for un new mineralization, gold, silver, copper at Columbus. And the Chinese here is at the well in Columbus. Very rare shot. This is at the north end of uh, the Columbus Salt Marsh. If you've driven past Mina, you take that summit uh, called Red Glitch, and then you look down toward Coaldale, and then to the left turn there to get into Tonopah. Look off the left on the north side of that Columbus Salt Marsh uh, is the old town of Columbus. <laughs> And there's still uh, ruins of the, one of the mills there today. They were borax mills. And here is uh, uh, the borax, well, the, right in downtown Columbus. You might have a hotel, Wells Fargo, State Station, all these other buildings. And then here is a mill right in the middle of town. You know, no regard to zoning, of course. <laughs> and this is a steam tractor, which actually made the newspapers at Columbus uh, the Candelaria newspaper, which was only about five miles away, the town. Uh, this steam tractor is, is getting some renewed interest by, by people who love history. A man over in England uh, traced down this very, where this uh, steam tractor was built, and all the parts were made in Cleveland. And he's writing an article about early steam tractors of, of the West. Uh, this one here functioned around Candelaria and Columbus for about, oh, probably less than a year. There's, there was one down at um, El Dorado Canyon, Southern Nevada. There's one parked out in front, the main interest of Furnace Creek Ranch, a big one. And, but they were not very practical. They were called traction engines because of that huge wheel. They could run right through sand and everything, but they burned up so much sagebrush fuel and wood that... Um, that uh, they really didn't last out in the desert very long. Here's the hitch to put a wagon on. But the man up on top was Chris Zabriskie. And he, there's a Zabriskie point down in Death Valley named after him. But he was a big borax miner in western Nevada in Death Valley for at least 30 years. Funny thing, way back in the late 60s when I was researching for that first book, I ran in, I talked to um, uh, a, a nephew, a niece of uh, Chris Zabriskie uh, over in the Bay Area, and she referred to Uncle Chris, Uncle Chris. I thought it was kind of neat that someone who's so historic would be referred to that way, especially someone that lived 80 years previous to when I met uh, <laughs> Mrs. Meadows. She wrote her own book about all of this, and it's a very good book 
called uh, sa uh, Sagebrush Heritage. Now over along the border, here's the uh, Walker Lake, Hawthorne would be there. Those little words there say Camel Trail because camels would haul salt from that Columbus Marsh we've been talking about way up toward Virginia City. It was an agent in ore reduction. But the border is important because the town of Aurora is sitting right on the border. Bodie would be over here. But this map is 1862, and Bodie was only a mining district, never a town until 1876. And around Aurora were 17 mills. Four of them were this huge. And there's foundations of this left today on the road between Bodie and Aurora, all about uh, 45 or 60 miles southwest of Hawthorne. And Mark Twain was there too. Mark Twain, in his book, a very valuable book, was in Carson City, Virginia City. He went up toward Unionville, way north of um, Lovelock, where he uh, mined for silver. At Aurora, he was um, he was um, working in a silver mill called a quartz mill. And he said, I can understand now why in Genesis, the book of Genesis in the Bible, that Adam had to work by the sweat of his brow because there's nothing worse than working in the quartz mill. <laughs> Just, um, it was extremely hard labor. But now Mark Twain is having the last laugh at us from the grave in his book. And he describes over here in the text about interviewing someone down in the Wide West Mine. And here, allegedly, is Mark Twain going down. See, he wrote the book ten years later, and he embellished every story. You've got to believe that. <laughs> uh, but, like I say, he's laughing to us from the grave. Went down there to interview, to interview someone in the mine. And once he left Aurora six weeks later, he was back in Virginia City, where he was a city editor. Back in those days, the editors were really reporters. So he was a reporter. He never got editor status. There were too many people older and more known than, than young Sam Clements, who became Mark Twain. Um, we're now leaving Lyme County and Mineral County and heading down toward Tonopah and Esmeralda County and a little bit of Nye County. Here's a typical 19th century stagecoach. Conquered a high high capacity, can haul maybe six passengers, lots of freight and especially luggage, six horse team. These, uh, these uh, types of uh, outfits fell into disuse around the 1880s, 1890s in Nevada because uh, the lower sleek conquered sta stage coaches uh, were, were fast becoming popular. Now in the 20th century, early in the 20th century, Things went really, really fast. There were railroads running all over Nevada. We had telegraph lines, telephones, automobiles, and these kind of stagecoaches were not very popular, but since they had such high capacity, they were brought back into service on the Tonopah and Manhattan stage line in central Nevada. Further down south, we had other railroads after the Carson Colorado Railroad. There was the Tonopah and Railroad, the Tonopah and Goldfield, heading down toward Bonnie Clare, south of, of, um, of the town of Goldfield. And see, now we're in the days of autos. And further east from that, <coughs> excuse me, out in the what's now the atomic test site, or the, the, the Nellis Air Force Base Gunnery Range, it was, um, uh, that's where we had uh, Jackass Flats and Yucca Flats and so forth. We, uh, atomic testing, back that was in the 50s and 60s, underground testing after that, of course. Um, way back around 1930, the Wanmoni boom, gold, uh, gold mining camp, sprang up right where Yucca Mountain is today. Y not with Yucca Mountain, but Yucca Flat. Here's the official Wanmoni town site. Someone promoters would lay out streets and, and stake out lots, and here probably these two people over here studying the town plat saying where to invest in, in real estate. And now, of course, uh, later on, atomic testing in that same area. And of course, no one can visit that place anymore. Just south of Beatty was Carrera, and the one big marble mine in Nevada, way up the top. And a little railroad came right down, uh, 
the, you can see the cart right there hauling cut uh, hauling uncut uh, uh, marble down to a point seven miles south of Beatty on the Las Vegas and Tonopah Railroad. Johnny Consolidated was another mine just further south from there where the Johnny mine sprang up. And uh, when I started ghost hunting in 1958, some of these buildings were still there. <clears throat> now it's all private, uh, a low-grade gold mine. Further north of Tonopah, and we're going to spend the rest of the black and white <coughs> portion of the talk, uh, around Belmont and, and uh, central Nevada, just just choice area for exploration. The uh, the town of Baxter Springs sprang up about sprang up about 30 miles north of Tonopah, and there's some there's some uh, uh, this low hill over here, and these outcrops right here, of course, are still there, and so one can find this town site by looking for those things, the outcrops, and then all of a sudden you find the town site of Baxter Springs where there's no buildings left then all of a sudden you realize they were because there's cellars over in there. Belmont was the, was the main mining camp of northern Nye County from 1868 until the boom at Tonopah after 1900. Courthouse over on the right is still standing. The main street is right here and it makes a turn right there and goes off to the uh, further north. The building right here is now a bed and breakfast called the Monitor Belmont Inn. And indeed, they've got several rooms uh, to the public. Here's a silver mill way down at the end of town over there. And there are two other big silver mills east of town. This is a view of Belmont looking west. Here's that building of the modern Belmont Inn. The church, a uh, Catholic church was built in the 1870s. In 1905, when Manhattan sprang up over in Smoky Valley, that the whole building was just taken over there and put up on the side of a hill and still there today, not used for mass, but rather maybe two or three times a year for weddings. And the courthouse at Belmont is still there, of course. Interesting shot, around 1880 or 1885, that horse, here's a, a prisoner right here, can be led away, but maybe by that horse, and maybe by, maybe he's gonna be taken to the old hanging tree, who knows. But the courthouse uh, in, the, in the 1960s, uh, one could walk in there. there uh, it was not a, a state park or anything like that. And climb up there, the belfry and so forth. But now, of course, the, the building, the roof's been restored. The back of the courthouse was blasted away by someone wanting brick. A lot of that's been restored. Further north of um, about between Tonopah and Austin, one of the most fascinating mining camps of Nevada is Ophir Canyon. And uh, <clears throat> it takes four-wheel drive to get up there. You cross the creek nine times. It's, well, if you know where the Round Mountain Mine is, the big mine there in, in the Smoky Valley, this is further north and up the canyon. The, uh, here's the shafts over here. Here's the mill over here. All that in, in that area looking from a different direction mill buildings here. And the stack still stayed there until the mid-1980s, that very stack right there. But someone blasted away one afternoon, and I remember interviewing someone down in Smoky Valley. They heard all the commotion. But by the time they got up there, the damage had been done, and the people escaped uh, further up the Toyabi Range went over west. So the culprits got away. Here's Smoky Valley down there. <clears throat> at uh, Manhattan, uh, there were four or five major mines. One of them, called the White Cap, uh, is in a remarkable condition. You go in the old town of Manhattan, about 60 miles north of Tonopah, and where the pavement ends, take a road off to the right and go about four miles, and there's a two-story bunkhouse there, and four or five big buildings. It's just off the beaten track, and so no one's desecrated it. But back in 1906, uh, there'd be a dance every weekend, the lady that loaned me this picture uh, is right over there. And when she loaned me the picture, she was about 
82 or 83 years old at the time. All my life, since high school days in Las Vegas, I've uh, been ghost towning and, of course, Goldwater bumper sticker on my Jeep. <laughs> in your heart, you knew he was right. <laughs> if we were the rest of the Goldwater today, we wouldn't be in 10 billion debts and so forth. <laughs> I think we're going to have a big turnover politically in 2010, Hopefully. especially in Nevada. Yeah. Uh, everywhere I travel, uh, there's discontent over the present, uh, and not so much state government, but our federal officials. Anyway, off of that, we're on the road to Pine Grove. <laughs> <laughs> and here's one of the bills at Belmont. Uh, the big stack still is just too sturdy to knock down. And the third mill at Belmont is off about two miles away, and all the, the, uh, the uh, walls, all four walls of the building are still there. Really nice. And it looks the same as it did 40 years ago. There's the mill at the south end of town. <clears throat> I pointed it out in the antique picture of, of, um, of Belmont. That 1965 Jeep Wagoneer with the big 327 engine in it <laughs> uh, took me to a lot of ghost towns, and I just can't part with it, even though I got two other Jeeps. I fired up once a month just to keep the engine going. A uh, Belmont uh, looked like this through the 60s, 70s, 80s, but this building, a lot, a lot of that's tumbled down. That one's completely gone. But nevertheless, the main street is very discernible in old Belmont, north of Tonopah. Up in those canyons of, of uh, central Nevada, here's the store of general merchandise of the old town of Jefferson, about halfway between Tonopah and Austin. And further west of Hawthorne, we travel on the road toward uh, from Hawthorne into Bodie. Uh, the old place called Fletcher is a ranch, and lots of ruins there. But the people, State Station, that's right, uh, but people have trashed it so much the last couple of years that the owners just simply put up big fences. They don't even allow anyone to uh, explore their, that area anymore. There's Fletcher. It's a garden spot. And why would someone just leave all their trash behind when they're camping? In 1861, I showed you the map uh, showing Aurora, ghost town now, right on the border between California and Nevada. The Ives surveyors would go through country like this to survey where that line would be, and finally Aurora was de deemed to be four miles within Nevada. As late as 1950, 51, there were stone buildings up and down, just two, not, not stone, brick buildings here, here. Oh, uh, it, it looked, it was, a, it was a movie set ghost town, but the used brick dealers after World War II came in and tore down every building and hauled all the bricks away down to Malibu and Orange County and so forth to build fireplaces and things like that. I kind of wish that every one of those fireplaces smoke. <laughs> <laughs> but it's still a good place today. The cemetery is in top shape condition and you can still wander around and see a lot of stuff at Aurora. Another shot, nearly the same one. Up in the north end of town of Aurora was the last chance saloon, and upstairs were red light features. Gone now. Bodie, of course, is a state park of California with the downtown and the area of the, the old Kane Mansion here. Uh, they, uh, with some little special permission, one can get, get the okay to go inside with one of the rangers. Uh, particularly if they're in a good mood. Between Bodie and Bridgeport is this Shimon Mine and Mill, and it's very colorful ruins of uh, both the uh, shaft and, and, the, and the mill there at Shimon, Shimon Mine. It's about eight miles east of Bridgeport. But, you know, there will be so many, this building can only take so many snows if it snows on top every winter, and someday it might be down, let's hope not too soon. Uh, Berlin Ikhsar State Park is about 120 miles east of Fallon. Uh, the assay house over here is the mill. 
of the uh, Berlin has been restored. In fact, there's a building built over the old mill, and you can go see the state fish, the Ikasaur fossil, the dinosaur fish at Berlin. And way back when I first started ghost towning in the 60s, there were, you'd see wagons like this out there, not so much in an abandoned place, but a place like I own where there's always people that guard them, like this, old freight wagon. But uh, last time I was there, I never saw those, but there, no one would simply would be able to take them away. They're probably in some barn. Uh, way up west of uh, Ely is, is the uh, ghost town of Treasure City. And the town was built all along in here at an altitude of 8,700 feet. And Wells Fargo moved in there very early and built that big building right there. And uh, it lasted only one year as far as the bank then moved down three miles down the slope to a bigger town. But Treasure City still had six, seven hundred, well, more than that, a few thousand residences uh, during the boom, but five, six hundred people by in 1880. Can you imagine living at 8,700 foot level and how cold it was, living in a tent? And here we were, and I was in Menden here last weekend, <laughs> shivering like everybody else. Cold, and, and we moderns really can't take it as well. Relics like this at the abandoned mining camp. I took this picture in 1968, went back a couple years later. There was two buckets like this, and both were gone. There's that bank building again. <laughs> More wheels at, uh, at, 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 um, at a ghost town uh, halfway between Middlegate and Ione, out in west central Nevada. The Tonopah Tidewater Railroad, which ran in the big mining camps of Tonopah Goldfield, went down through Amargosa Canyon east of Death Valley. Uh, I took my Jeep down through there. You had to use the winch a few times. No longer, because it's now a wilderness area. And I don't know why we're saving all this land in wilderness areas. Saving it for who? We should be able to enjoy this stuff today. Harry Reid. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Reid, yeah. <laughs> By the way, uh, that man has no popularity north of North of Vegas anymore. <laughs> you, you see these signs all over the state. <laughs> Anyone but... I asked someone in Ely of the Republican Central Committee, he said, hey, you did a good job putting up these Harry Reid signs of anyone but Harry Reid. He said, the man and wife said, we didn't put those signs up, the Democrats did. <laughs> <laughs> For ghost towners, nothing politics. For ghost towners, going in the wintertime to see mining camps or ghost towns and old mill ruins does not stop you. The dedicated one will go out there and eat this in 30 degree weather. Uh, here's an old bunkhouse at Betty O'Neill near Battle Mountain. Uh, Broken Hills between Middlegate and Gaps used to have several buildings. I went by there last summer and there was very little left. Here's the Tipsy oh. Saloon. <laughs> uh, the, oh, the ranchers, they dilapidated so badly that ranchers simply tore it down, but that was a saloon north of Elko at Charleston. And here's the line of the Virginia Truckee Railroad. It's been, been built from, from Virginia City, Gold Hill, past Mountain House. The terminus is over just barely north of the river. And, but now it will be built through uh, this canyon in the next few years. You can still drive it past the Santiago Cut, just about a half mile north of here is where the railroad tracks end. B&T will go right around that cut, past that previous picture, and I just can't wait to uh, ride the train all the way to Carson City someday. Pine Grove, I mentioned that earlier, mining camp of uh, the 1870s, 1880s, still a few buildings left, more Pine Grove. The mill at Pine Grove. Uh, here's the old bull wheel. The stamps that crush the ore used to be right between those two big eight by eight timbers. Uh, study in ruins, the old town of Lewis near Battle Mountain. <coughs> just death and decay, just desolation. Uh, 
you know, you can go into canyons even north of Reno and tucked away would be some building like this. You wonder who built it, why is it still there, and so forth. And that's what the business of research in ghost towns is all about. Uh, definitely ruins of a mercantile store west of Ely, Shermantown. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the big $250,000 uh, stamp mill uh, at, uh, well I mentioned the words Treasure City in Shermantown. It's all about 50 miles west of Ely. And now even all the foundations, it still had a lot of wood at, until about two summers ago. But a fire went through that area and burned those timber. So they're gone now. Another mill in that same district called Monte Cristo. Hamilton, 45 miles west of Ely. Hamilton, Treasure City, Shermantown, Everhart, all in there together. And the facade was there in 1960 when I first saw it, and now it's in ruins. Our mining camps are disappearing fast, but there's still a lot to see. <coughs> Persons should identify their pictures. I took this picture uh, north, uh, just southwest of Goldfield uh, in the late 60s, never identified the spot. Tried to look for it again by matching up the mountains. But I, I knew where it was because the sequence of slides, slide number one or two previous was Gold Point, after that was Lida, so this was Stewart's Mill, but all these buildings are gone now. Uh, going along old railroad tracks, there used to be sidings like this on the railroad, and trace down an old road like this, where does it go? Where, it's, it's a road leading to adventure somewhere. And then, you trace it. Every road, every road leads to some kind of a ruin out there in the desert. The old tracks of the Eureka Palisade Railroad, you kind of let your mind drift away and uh, get away from the business of living in the city or in the towns and just imagine maybe some guy threw out an old beer bottle when he was riding on the trains years ago. But just enjoy the fresh air and so forth. Here, I, I just added these slides today, there's four of them here. Beautiful architecture, and this thing is still there today at Cloverdale, about 40 miles north of Tone Park. Here's adobe, and there's brick, uh, there, uh, there's um, adobe brick, stone, and then wood ruins all in one building. So you see, after the place was uh, built, abandoned, built, people added on to the building. An old stage station with lots of ruins including the station itself, right there, on the left. And most of this is still there today. Remarkable. It would be about 40 miles north of Tone Park. And, of course, getting out and looking at old grave sites like this is part of the hobby of ghost towning. It's a lot of fun. Or then we get into camp, enjoy, after a day of exploration, you sit around, swap stories and before dinner. Or maybe you're going to be out by yourself with one person, and we're studying the map, uh, with my two friends there, determining where to go next. And I know where I'm going next because this is the end of the Bookstown slideshow for the <laughs> <laughs>